Okay, folks, good afternoon. Um, in case you just walked in, the sign-up sheet is circulating and the second homework assignment is graded. Um, um, any questions? So everybody recovered from the break? Okay, so we have another break coming up next week. Exciting times. The weather is getting nicer, uh, except for today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to continue our lecture about car and mode control. So the first method that we discussed about, we started the discussion about like three weeks ago. I did not label it back then, I just called it the feedback control, but as it turns out, the common name for that approach is voltage mode control. So the approach is we measure the output voltage through a sensing network. Then we compare it with a source, some sort of a reference. This is because we are trying to regulate the output voltage. Then we construct the error V of E, V sub E over here. Um, then we apply this error to a compensation network and last time we actually ended up designing a compensation network based on the zeros and poles and the small signal model. Then after that, the signal that we got, we called it the control signal or the control voltage and we interpreted that signal as the duty cycle, meaning that if the signal is rising, that means we should keep increasing the duty cycle. If the signal is falling, that means we should actually reduce the value of the duty cycle. That is why after this block, we use a PWM block to basically convert the level of the signal into the width of our pulses, which is basically the duty cycle. So if the output voltage is smaller than where it is supposed to be, uh, the, out, the error increases, the output of the compensation network increases, that means we should increase the duty cycle. And vice versa, if the output voltage is smaller than what it is supposed to be. Um, this, common, this is a common trend, uh, at least among Bach boost and Bach boost converters, in a sense that if we increase the duty cycle, the output voltage increases. If you reduce the duty cycle, the output voltage reduces. Now, as it turns out, this, uh, this control approach is not the fastest approach possible. You may argue that it is the simplest approach possible because all we got to do is just to measure the output voltage. But it is not fast in a sense that we have another state, another control state, a state from a control perspective in the system that we do not even measure, and that is the current that is passing through the inductor. So you may argue that instead of doing things this way, I may want to actually measure the current of the inductor and actually incorporate that in my decision-making process. And that's what we are going to be discussing now, which is called the, volt uh, the current mode control, because now we also measure the current or dual loop control um, you, or current inject control, things like that. I, I had a very sure. Mode is like faster. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would we say that like uh, one one of the loops is of the order of microseconds and the other loop is in the order of seconds or something like that? Like in terms uh, of time domain. In terms of time, or oh, when we say faster, all of these are in the order of milliseconds. Even the voltage mode control. Remember when we were looking at some simulation results, and for instance, I applied a step change in the load. It took the system maybe. I don't know, even less than a millisecond to recover. So since the switching frequency, let's say your switching frequency is 100 kilohertz, that means one switching period is about, is not about, is accurately, accurately 100 microseconds, 10 microseconds, right? So in a couple of switching cycles, the system recovers. So we are looking at less than even a millisecond dynamic. Seconds are too long in power electronics. A couple of seconds is, is actually too long. Um, so now the way we do it now is, first of all, we have to measure the inductor current. Um, the simplest way of measuring a current is adding a resistance, a small resistance on the path of the current, 
and then measuring that voltage. So the voltage is proportional with the current. It's not a very ap accurate approach. We also add some losses to the system because there is a resistor extra on the path. But at the same time, it's the cheapest way of measuring current. So first of all, we are adding a little bit of a complexity to the system, at, at least as far as the measurements are concerned. Uh, the voltage measurement is the same. We are, for instance, using a, like a resistive divider kind of a thing to measure the voltage. Uh, we are still are comparing that with a reference because the ultimate goal has not changed. We are still trying to regulate the output voltage. We still use a voltage compensator to, for instance, increase the bandwidth or um, uh, make the system stable uh, or eliminate the steady state error. The main difference is we treat the output of the voltage compensator differently. Before, we were assuming that it was the duty cycle. If that signal goes up, that means the duty cycle should increase. But here, we are treating as if it is the reference for the inductor current, meaning that if this signal rises, we have to command the converter to inject more current in the inductor, something like that. And again, all these converters have the same common feature. If the current of the inductor increases, the output voltage increases. Like in a buck converter, it's very, very simple to argue. If this current that is going in here increases, and the resistor is the output resistance is constant, that means your output voltage increases. All right. So we are going to discuss this. We are going to come up with a small signal model for this as well. Um, so uh, the way it works is, first of all, there are three different ways of doing that, at least three different ways of doing current mode control. Uh, what I have shown over here is a very simple case of, it is called peak current mode control. So let me discuss that one first. <coughs> Okay, so, um, Excuse me. yes? I have a question. Uh, here we are also measuring the voltage, right? Right. So how, how come it's faster than the voltage mode control? Well, we are going to, we are going to see that in some, um, in some modeling approaches and bandwidth comparison and some simulation results. Uh, but, but think about it this way. If you want to, you know, just linguistically, linguistically talk about why is this faster? Uh, here, if the, let's argue this way, if the inductor current is not where it is supposed to be, for instance, your load is demanding, I don't know, 5 amps, and the inductor current on average should be in the buck converter also 5 amps, but it is not. How are you going to figure that out? That current goes to the output, the output voltage decreases, then you realize that there is something going on. Here, you are directly controlling the current of the inductor. So as soon as something goes wrong, you're directly controlling it. So in a faster way, you can respond. Or basically, you have more information about the system. Because not only you have the state of the capacitor or voltage, you also have the state of the inductor current. But we're going to see that what I mean by faster. It's not like a million times faster. I mean, it's a little bit faster. Um, OK, other questions? OK, so there are three basic ways of doing this uh, current mode control, and the most common one, because it's the cheapest way of doing it, is called the peak current mode control. So the way it works is, so I'm drawing, for instance, uh, IREF. So whenever I talk about IREF, I'm referring to the signal over here, which is the output of my voltage compensator. Now, before it was the duty cycle. Now I'm actually be interpreting it in a different way. So let's say this is your IREF, OK? And these are the switching cycle. Now, this is an exaggeration. The output of the, the compensation network does not change this fast compared to the switching cycle. This is just an exaggeration. So uh, let's say this is the inductor current. At the beginning of the each cycle, we turn the switch on. How do we turn the switch on? For instance, we can have a clock which identifies the beginning of the cycle. This is this clock over here, like a 100 kilohertz clock. So at the beginning of each cycle, you get a signal 
and we can treat that signal to set a latch or a flip-flop basically. So the output jumps up. So as soon as the clock actually sends us a signal, the output goes up, meaning that the transistor should be turned on, something like that. All right, so at the beginning of each cycle, using the clock, we turn the switch on. In all of these converters, when you turn the switch on, in mode one, the inductor current rises. Okay, so inductor current ramps up, mode one. Then uh, as soon as the inductor current tends to get larger than the reference, we already have the re reference available, that means we have to basically compare the inductor current and the reference. And that comparison is being <coughs> made in this block over here. Okay, so as soon as the inductor current tends to get larger than the, uh, the reference, we reset that latch, meaning that the output of the latch is zero, meaning that the switch should be turned off. So we basically turn the switch off. <coughs> and that's it. So the next cycle arrives, and we just keep repeating this. Uh, so I mean, my slopes are a little bit, hold on, let me make it a little bit easier. For instance, we get to this point. Then the next cycle arrives. Again, there is a signal from the clock. We turn the switch on because the the latch or the flip-flop is basically set. And then again, the inductor current tends to get larger than the reference. We turn the switch off. And we keep doing this. Or something like this. Uh, as I said, uh, you can see the inductor current is a little bit distorted, but in practice it is not like that because the reference doesn't change this much. Uh, but the <coughs> argument that you can make is we are trying to basically make sure that the peak value of the inductor current is tracking its reference. So that's why it's called the peak current mode control. So the reference is used to basically determine the peak value of the inductor current. Okay. Now, this is not the best that we expect because ideally we would like to control the average value of the inductor current, not the peak value, because the average value determines the load current, not the peak value. But this is the best we can do here, and this is very simple, and it's a very, very common way of doing current mode control. So this is the most common way. Uh, common way. So the red one is the inductor current. which is basically this con. All right. Another way is called kind of the kind of the opposite of way this which is called valley control. Okay? Okay, valley current mode control, instead of controlling the peak, this time we are controlling the minimum value of the inductor current. Okay. So, so we have this cycle again, determined by the clock. So let's say the inductor current is here. This time, we turn the switch off at the beginning of each cycle. So the inductor current ramps down. And then as soon as the, it hits the reference, we turn the switch on. So it ramps up. And again, at the beginning of the cycle, we turn the switch off. The inductor current ramps down. And then it ramps up. And so on and so forth. So this time, instead of controlling the peak, we are actually controlling the minimum values of the inductor current. So it's called the valley, you know, current mode control. And the best of all, in terms of accuracy, is but it's not as simple and straightforward. Is called the average current mode control.
Now this one is a little bit harder to describe because we need an external RAM. And I haven't even discussed any external RAM yet, so um, I'm just going to explain it as simple as it gets. And then hopefully we might even have some simulations later discussing this. So the objective over here is don't control the peak, don't control the basically um, the, the valley control the average value of the inductor current. So first thing that we got to do is to find the average value of the inductor current. So our sensing network that measures the inductor current, as in a simple case, it could be a very simple resistor. Now it should also include a low-pass filter, which gives us the average value information of the inductor current. So you're kind of getting two very smooth, smoothly moving signals. One is the average value of the inductor current measured. The other one is the output of your compensation network. Then you have to add or subtract some sort of an external RAM to one of them and then compare them against each other. But in general, the outcome would be something like this. The outcome would be as if you're controlling the average value of the inductor current. All right, something like this. Okay. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's a little bit sluggish because we are using a, a low-pass filter to give us the information about the average value of the inductor current. All right. Mm -hmm. Do we prevent the converter from working on VCM? Um, presumably, yes, assuming that the operational conditions would support that. Yes, yes, that's right. That's an interesting observation, yes. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, um, so pretty much the peak current mode control is the most common. I would say like 95% of the times when you talk about current mode control, you're talking about peak current mode control. And it has a drastic or you know, inherent problem. And I'm going to actually explain the problem first. And there is a very simple solution for the problem. <clears throat> All right. So what is the problem? Um, there is a stability problem. Is this the correct way of spelling peak? There is a C in it or not? No, no. There is no C. It looks uh, strange to me. <laughs> and I'm writing and say, no, this is not correct. My notes, there is a C in it. I say, why is there a C in there? All right, I'm glad we got correct on the record. Um, all right, so this is a peak current mode control, peak current mode control. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Practically, IREF is, I, the reference for the current is a very kind of a slow, dynamic kind of a signal. It doesn't change very much. Or basically, when we zoom in, when it comes to one switching cycle, IREF doesn't change much. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm assuming IREF is almost constant. OK. So IREF is constant, and the inductor current is, let's say the duty cycle is less than 0.5. OK, something like this. And we are controlling the peak value of the inductor current. Now, in order to discuss the stability, let's presume um, our inductor current is not where it is supposed to be. So the inductor current, for some reason, has been disturbed. OK? So I'm showing the disturbance in blue. So let's say, initially, your inductor current is at this point, instead of being lower than that. So now, if you pursue the current mode control um, I was hoping my drawings would be a little bit better than this but anyway my point is after a few cycles this disturbance kind of damps down 
Okay. So when the duty cycle is less than 0.5, We don't really have this stability or chaotic problem because if the duty cycle, uh, if the in inductor current is disturbed a little bit, it gradually, that disturbance, because of the logic that we are using, gradually it goes to zero basically. Now let's consider a case <coughs> where the duty cycle is greater than 0.5. Okay, something like this. All right, so as you can see, the, the on time of the switch is larger than the off time is of the switch. Therefore, um, the duty cycle greater, is greater than 0.5. Ideally, this is what we would like our inductor current to look like. But practically, and we are going to see that in simulations as well, so if you have a little bit of a disturbance, let's say your initial disturbance is here. OK? So let's see what happens. You go up, then come down, then go up, come down. OK. So you can see that our inductor current never settles where it is supposed to be settling. That error is actually causing some chaotic behavior. Sometimes at the end of the cycle, the error is smaller than the beginning of the cycle. Sometimes it's larger. And on average, the error is zero, but we are always either too much positive error or too much negative error. So we have a kind of a chaotic behavior. So, um, so they realize this is the problem associated with the, with the peak kind mode control. And there is a very simple solution for that, and that is adding some external ramp. OK, so let's take a look at that. OK, so uh, I'm going to draw IRF. assuming that it is relatively constant. And um, let me just focus on maybe one period. <coughs> Let's say we are basically, we are counting our basically periods and um, we have also an external ramp. Let me extend this a little bit more. All right. So we are kind of it's like in our in our controller we are generating first of all first of all the ramp that's not a big deal because in the PWM switching scheme we also generate a, a kind of a soft switch ramp and then we subtract that ramp from our reference so our ramps start from zero kind of like the PWM thing and then gradually ramps down and at the end of the cycle we reset the ramp to zero again so we're just going from zero to some peak value and then coming back to to zero um, this external ramp is sometimes it's, it is called the auxiliary ramp, and the slope is considered to be negative, obviously, of m of a. a. m stands for ramp. I don't know why, but a is the auxiliary, basically. So it's basically this is slope over here. All right. And now let's look at the inductor current. OK. Remember, under steady state conditions, the initial value of the inductor current and the final value of the inductor current are supposed to be the same. So if I'm under steady state conditions, meaning that everything is stable, uh, these two values are supposed to be the same. But what if the system is perturbed?
Okay. So technically, I'm interested in how much the signal was initially perturbed at the beginning of the cycle, how much the system is perturbed at the end of the cycle. If I can prove that at the end of the cycle, the perturbance is smaller than the beginning of the cycle, that means gradually the system is going to, this perturbance is going to damp down to zero and the system is going to become a kind of a steady state behavior. Now, there is a little bit of a geometry involved, so let me make some notes over here. So this initial value is inductor current evaluated at, OK. And this blue one over here is plus some disturbance. Okay, and in the end, we are looking at plus some disturbance. Now, don't worry about the, ma the, uh, the polarity of the disturbance. It could be sometimes positive, it could be negative, but we look at the absolute value of the disturbance. Okay, so... Uh, as I said, there is some geometry involved. We are not going to do it. All I am going to highlight, uh, highlight is this uh, slope. When we are in mode 1, what M1 is, the rising slope of the inductor current. And then M2, which is the slope is negative, And I take the negative thing out. So M2 is actually turns out to be positive, And that is the falling slope of the inductor current. So if you remember uh, from different converters, I'm just going to write them up over here, what M1 is and what M2 is. So if you remember from the Bach topology in mode 1, switch is on, V in minus V out is applied across the inductor. So the slope is V in or minus V out over L. In the second mode, switch was off, diode was on, the output voltage appears across the inductor with a negative polarity. We already took the negative sign out, so the slope is V out over L. For the boost, it's kind of the opposite. This is V in over L, and this is V out minus V in over L. And for the Bach boost, it is V in over L for mode 1, and V out over L for mode 2. OK. Um, the other thing I want to highlight over here is um, under steady state conditions. The amount, or basically delta IL, the amount that the inductor rises is equal to the amount that the inductor current falls, meaning that at the end of the cycle, the inductor current is the same as what it was at the beginning of the cycle. So under steady state conditions, we have this equation holding. If you simplify this equation, you will get M2 over M1 is D over 1 minus D. So in all these converters, M2 over N1 always is D over 1 minus D. OK. So this was a little bit of a background information. Let's go back to our graph. We have a reference. comes from the voltage compensation block. We kind of subtract a sawtooth waveform or an external ramp or an auxiliary ramp from that reference. And then we do peak on mode control, basically. OK, so once you do this geometrical analysis, you're going to end up with this expression. The amount of perturbance at the end of the cycle is the amount of perturbance at the beginning of the cycle multiplied by this expression.
okay? And we define what M1, M2, and M sub A are. M1 is the rising ramp of the inductor current. M2 is the falling ramp, taking care of the negative sign already. And M sub A is the ramp or the slope of our, basically, um, of our auxiliary signal. Okay. I'm going to just label this whole thing as alpha. Okay. All right. So, uh, first of all, we would like our disturbance at the end of the cycle to be uh, smaller than the disturbance at the beginning of the cycle. That means that the disturbance gradually fades down to zero. So, in, in order to have our current mode controller or P current mode controller uh, stable, we got to make sure alpha in terms of magnitude is a smaller than one, okay? So if you look at alpha, uh, first of all, assume that there is no auxiliary ramp or M sub A is zero. So let's consider that. So if we do not add any auxiliary ramp, or no, no external ramp, then alpha is nothing but negative m2 over m1, which in those converters is d over 1 minus d. It is less than 1 um, if d is less than 0.5. It is greater than 1 if d is greater than 0.5. So this is nothing but the problem that we had to begin with. That means that if the duty cycle is less than 0.5, as I drew earlier, there's no problem. It automatically adjusts itself. If the duty cycle is greater than 0.5, we have a chaotic behavior. And this basically formulation shows the same, same conclusion, basically. So now you can argue that, for instance, so MA is actually our control parameter. You can argue that given the circumstances, the, given the operating conditions, you can choose a particular value for MA to make sure alpha is, alpha is always less than 1 regardless of the value of the duty cycle. For instance, choose, for instance, Something like this. As the designer of the converter, we know what our input voltage is, approximately what our output voltage is, and what the value of our inductor is. So finding M2 is not very hard. I mean, we look up this table and say, OK, M2, if it is a buck converter, is nothing but V out over L. So we actually have the numerical value for M2 anyway. So now, for instance, let's say you have adjusted the, the block that is generating this auxiliary slope to create a ramp, half uh, a slope that is half of M2. So for this value, again, I am not proving it here. I'm just writing results. For the entire range of the duty cycle, alpha is going to be always a smaller than 1. Therefore, your system is a stable, no matter what the value of the duty cycle is. And as it turns out, this is the minimum value that you can choose for M sub A to have it stable for the entire range. But sometimes you realize that in, in an actual converter, your duty cycle doesn't really vary all the way from, for instance, 
point 0.1 all the way to point 0.9. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a smaller range for your duty cycle to change. And in that case, you don't really have to go to a, select an MA that is as drastic as I actually we have it on the screen. Any M sub A, any external RAM that is larger than this half of M2 is guaranteed to make your system stable, but do not overcompensate the system. Because once you make it larger and larger and larger, what you do is you're making a distance between so before, ideally, our peak current mode control was supposed to control the peak values of the inductor current. Like here, the peak values of the inductor current were following the reference. By introducing this external ramp, what is happening is we are creating even an error between the peak value of the inductor current and IREF. So if you choose an auxiliary RAM that is too large, this error is going to be too large, and it's not good. All right. Um, there is an interesting observation here, and that is if we choose the auxiliary RAM to be equal to M2, first of all, it's larger than half of M2, therefore, stability is guaranteed. But if you look at the expression for alpha, on the numerator, we have M2 minus MA. If I choose MA to be equal to M2, so alpha becomes 0. OK? This is an interesting thing in control. That means no matter how much your initial disturbation is, at the end of the cycle, your disturbation is your uh, your disturbance is zero, basically. Okay, um, so it's called a deadbeat control. Okay, and that means your settling time is actually one cycle. So if I choose M2, MA, the auxiliary RAM, to be equal to M2, the falling slope of the, um, of the inductor current, alpha is 0, meaning that your disturbance at the end of the cycle is 0, regardless of the initial value of the disturbance at the beginning of the cycle. Very, very interesting feature. Uh, sometimes some people actually do it that way, to actually have a very, very fast dynamic response. It's the fastest dynamic response that you can actually achieve. Uh, all right, any questions? So we, I don't have it today with me, but uh, hopefully tomorrow on, on Thursday I will have some simulation files, simulation models, so I can actually look at this auxiliary RAM. Yes? Can you repeat, uh, why do we get a like, uh, fastest dynamic response? Fastest dynamic response is because, OK, let me draw it over here. Maybe we should draw it here. All right, now I'm actually MA is the same as M2, OK? Now, so let's consider one period. OK, under steady state conditions, this is my inductor current. OK, so it ramps up. It hits the, the, the auxiliary ramp. The switch turns off, and I come back down. And because M2 and MA are the same, I exactly come back down in parallel or overlapping the, the uh, M, M, M2. Now, if I have some initial per, per disturbance, again, I come back down here. So no matter what the value of my initial uh, disturbance is, let me pick another color. So my final value of the inductor current is where it is supposed to be, is the steady state value. So that means in one period, the error is eliminated. In the previous approach, in the previous values of MA, it may take several periods. So I have a large one here. 
then a little bit smaller here, then a little bit smaller here, then finally it fades down. It takes several cycles to fade down here. At the end of the cycle, it's gone <coughs> already. Okay, that's why it's faster. So th th that seems like a desirable feature. Is it just okay. because it's somewhat hard to do because M2 j changes depending on the voltages? Yes, uh, you cannot maybe accurately measure the inductor value. You have an idea your inductor is, for instance, 100 micro. It might be a little bit different than what it is. But yeah, you can do that. Actually, with good approximation, you're getting closer and closer to this desired feature. Yes? But that would have to be calculated continuously if the model's output voltage or input voltage changes depending on That's the That's right. So design. you need to have like an adaptive kind of a system and measuring the input and the output or the slope somehow. And yeah, actually, there are papers out there doing that. Um, with some simple mechanism, try to estimate M2 in an accurate way and then add it over here. Yeah. Um, all right, so this was all about this deadbeat control. There are papers out there, uh, interesting topic. Um, uh, so we are going to continue on this uh, peak current mode control, and we are going to look at some modeling aspect for the peak current mode control. Um, any questions? Okay, so let's look at our modeling approach is relatively general in a sense that we don't really say, are we talking about peak or valley or average current mode control techniques? Uh, it could be applicable to all of them because we are at the beginning, we are making an approximation. And the approximation is the inductor current is exactly the same as the reference, okay? So technically, we are kind of neglecting the ripple in the inductor current. Once you neglect the ripple in, that, in the inductor current, the whole concept of uh, the whole concept of current mode control is force the inductor current to follow its reference. So it's safe to make an assumption that the inductor current and the reference are the same. Now, this keeps our model makes our model very simple and easy to understand. However, there are papers out there uh, which actually do not make this assumption. And there's a lot of math involved, and if you're interested, you can go and actually follow that. At the end of the day, if you're only trying to design, if you're a mathematician, obviously you're unhappy about this approximation. You want to have the absolute correct you know, solution. But if your objective is just to design a compensation network, then this approximation is still works. So that's why we are doing it this way, because we are not mathematicians, and uh, we are happy with this approximation. So. Uh, Let's look at small signal model. For uh, current mode control. All right. And So our approximation is that the inductor current and the reference are almost, or the inductor current and reference are almost the same, or we are neglecting the ripple in the inductor current. So this is to make this the model simpler. So remember how we modeled um, our voltage mode control or a small signal model for our single pole double through switch. Uh, we started with a DC analysis and then we perturbed that DC analysis. So we are going to do the exact same thing here. Um, similar to the previous case, first we model a, the Bach converter and then we generalize that to any kind of single pole double through switch. So let me draw the Bach topology first.
so this is the Nectarcon. And okay. So we have this con mode control block. Let's pre pretend it's a P con mode control block. And the input to this block is the reference that is coming from our compensation network. And then that block decides whether the switch should be on or off, or in the top position or the bottom position. And by this, we are arguing that the inductor current relatively follows the reference, something like this. All right. So I'm going to label this node to be our pole, basically. So if you remember from a DC analysis, the voltage of this pole, let's say this is our ground, <coughs> with respect to the ground is the input voltage times the duty cycle. We had it before. <coughs> also, if I label this to be I1, the DC value of I1 is the DC value of the inductor current. Uh, let me call it the pole current. Uh, the DC value of the pole current times the duty cycle. And also, the approximation is the pole current is following the reference or in terms of DC values, they are the same, OK? All right. So this is coming from our approximation. The last one is coming from an approximation. Now, um, I can combine these two, the last two equations, and write it this way. I1 is nothing but I ref times the duty cycle, OK? <coughs> and I combine it with the top equation now. <coughs> and I get I1 is nothing but I ref. Instead of D from the top equation, I will place it with VP over VN. So I kind of combine these three equations with each other. And let me write it this way. OK. All right, something like this which is nothing but the balance of power, basically. The input power to the switching network is equal to the output power to the switching network. The input power is the difference between the throw voltages, which is Vn in this case, in the buck topology. And the input current is I1. And in terms of output parameters, we have Vp as the output voltage of the switching network, and Ip, that is the current that's coming out. So the input power is the same as uh, the output power. So balance of power. OK. All right. So I have this kind of DC a steady a state equation, kind of like we did for the other uh, small uh, signal approaches. I'm going to perturb this, basically. Now I'm assuming that I1 has a little bit of perturbation in addition to the DC value.
something like this. And obviously, everything is a function of time. I forgot to put t over here, but the perturbations are dependent on time. They are variable. OK. So I kind of expand this, and let's expand it. So I have i1, vn, dc values, i1, vn perturbed, vn, i1 perturbed, and then two perturbations multiplied by each other. I ref VP DC values, I ref VP perturbed, I ref perturbed, VP plus um, the last component is two small signals, I ref multiplied by VP. All right. Similar to the thing that we did before, if I have two perturbations multiplied by each other, they are both small signals multiplied by each other, we can neglect them. Or we basically, we are linearizing the system here. So this is almost 0. This one is almost 0. OK? And um, the DC side on the left-hand side should be the same as the DC side on the right-hand side. So this DC should be the same as this which is nothing but this equation on the left is the same on the right. So that's, that's, the, that's already a given. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, so, uh, so the conclusion is I1 Vn perturbed plus Vn I1 perturbed should be the same as I ref VP perturbed plus I ref perturbed or VP I ref perturbed. Okay, so remember in all of these small signal models, our DC steady state values appear like here I1 capital, VN capital, I ref capital, <coughs> and VP capital are the DC values that come from our DC analysis. All right, so now I'm going to actually uh, write I1 equals and put ev move everything to the uh, right and uh, left-hand side. I'm sorry, right-hand side. Um, Now that I have the equation, um, I can actually draw a, a schematic, a circuit diagram that represents this equation. So let me do that. So we did all of this to have a good uh, you know, uh, expression for I1, which is the current that is drawn from our source, basically. Okay? So our source is a, now a perturbed source. We are not doing a DC analysis. So we have this source that is perturbed. And I should kind of synthesize I1 here. Which has three elements in it. And OK, the circuit equivalent would look like this. The very first term over here, I have I1 proportional with the input voltage itself is, is resembling like a resistance. 
and the value of this resistance turns out to be negative and I'm going to explain why it is negative in a few minutes and it's actually V in over I1 with a negative polarity and we happen to label this resistor to be R1 then uh, there is another component over here so one current is proportional with another current it's like a dependent current source so I'm just going to draw it as a dependent current source And the last component is proportional with VP. And VP is on the like a secondary side, so I'm going to actually use a transformer. Or here, I'm just going to use another dependent source of current. And what about VP itself? So remember the original approximation or assumption that we made was that the inductor current is following its reference. So to kind of demonstrate that I'm putting them in series with each other. This way the inductor current is always following this reference. And this is P. Okay. And after the inductor we have the rest of the converter. This is a buck converter so we have a, a capacitor and a resistor. Okay, now the input to this small signal is actually IRF perturb. Okay, so the main, the main difference between this model and the model that we developed er earlier as a voltage control model was over there, duty cycle was the control input. Here, duty cycle exists, but it's more like an internal signal. We don't really care about the, the duty cycle. We care about the reference for the inductor current as an input. That's why when I was actually drawing this block diagram over here, you can see that IREF is going in. Duty cycle is like an internal signal. We don't re it doesn't really show up in our model. And um, so this is how it is supposed to, to look like. Um, any questions so far? Yes. If there are one, how did you get, why is Vn over I1 as opposed to above in the equation where I1 is over Vn? Okay. Remember, resistor is voltage over current. So if you see something different than that, so in terms of dimensions. But uh, if, uh, if you neglect, let's say if you, let's say you neglect these components, meaning that you're neglecting the rest of the system. If you are trying to have a resistor resembling that equation, the current would be something like this. So R1 is V in over I1 with a negative sign. OK. Other questions? OK, let's see if I can undo this. Oh, these guys over here, like this one and this one? Uh, yeah, because we kind of have a KCL. We have one current added to another current added to another current. It's like we have three branches in parallel with each yeah, other. Uh, but why do we? Okay. okay. <coughs> All right. Any other questions? It could be connection between uh, IRF. Oh, this thing over here? Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> 
This thing, because if you remember, this is representing a basically, in this box topology, it doesn't really matter. But uh, remember, this is representing a three terminal system because our, we are trying to model this three terminal block. If I don't make that connection, it turns into a four terminal block. And sometimes you can argue that there is no return for the current. Okay? Sometimes in some converters. Okay? In the buck converter, it doesn't, it doesn't really disturb anything. All right, let's see if I can undo this one. OK. So um, before I forget, yes? Why the sign of R1 is negative? Uh, is it because the uh, sign of the current is negative so that? Uh, because, oh, become mathematically, because there is a negative, negative sign here, OK? So we have a current that is proportional with its voltage in a negative way. So it's a negative resistance. Now, why? how can we explain this coin? Why is it that this coin is negative? I'm going to explain it right now, actually. So, so first observation that we make is, so observations one is that R1 is negative. OK, why? So here is why. So let's pretend we are not perturbing anything in the system except for the input voltage. So for instance, the reference for the inductor current is not being perturbed, or perturbations are 0, OK? Uh, so. If I ref is constant, in other words, oh, but, oh yeah, I ref per chirp is zero. Okay, so if I ref is constant, it's like we are forcing the inductor to follow the current of the inductor to follow a constant current, and because the load is a constant, the output voltage is constant, right? And also the output power is constant. Okay, the output voltage is constant, the output resistance is constant. So everything on the output side is pretty much constant. So P out is constant. Okay. If P out is constant, Assuming that the efficiency is 100%, that means P in is constant, right? Um, I would say, um, OK, so let me just write it P in. P out is constant. All right, now remember what P in is. P in is the average value of the input voltage multiplied by the average value of the input current. <coughs> so if I draw this, it would look something like this. So it's like a constant power kind of a load, OK? Now, if I'm interested in one particular operating point, which is our DC operating point, this is the DC value of the input voltage, and this is the DC value of the current that is drawn from the input voltage. But if I perturb around this operating point, my slope is negative, OK? And this slope happens to be 1 over R1. So 
So this kind of explains this negative slope. So it's like a, if the reference current is constant, I'm dealing with a constant power load. If I increase the input voltage because the power is constant, the current reduces. So it's like a r negative resistance kind of a behavior in a small signal fashion. OK. So this was one of the observations that we have on the input side. We almost like have a negative resistance, basically. And uh, there is a second observation, and that is So this is observation one, or maybe this is observation one. The second observation is the system is not a second order system anymore. Before, we had an inductor, we had a capacitor, we looked at all the transfer functions, it resembles the second order behavior. However, if you look at the output side of this small signal model, this side I mean, you can see that there is an inductor, there is a current source placed with the inductor. That means the inductor doesn't have its own dynamic anymore. Whatever that current source is, it is actually forcing the inductor current to follow that. So technically, This is the same as drawing it this way. All right. Okay. <coughs> so it's a first order system. So that's one of the advantages of the current mode control. Because at least when you're talking about the Bach converter, the dynamic of the inductor is almost eliminated. We force the current of the inductor to follow a particular reference. That means as if the inductor doesn't have its own dynamic anymore. Okay, we are taking that away from it. Okay. Um, so that's a good thing. And as it turns out, when you are designing a compensation network, for the for this current mode controllers, um, the transfer functions are very simple. Uh, at, at least assuming that the approximation that we have made, which was uh, I ref and IL are the same. So we made this approximation. Where did where did I write it? Okay, we made this approximation over here, and as a result of that, we kind of eliminated the the dynamic of the inductor, and we are reduced down to a first order system, which is just a capacitor. Uh, so that's actually a good thing a lot of times. Um, any questions? Yes? For the uh, current mode control, uh, we have in the control diagram, we took a feedback of the inductor current. OK. And let's say uh, if my load changes now. OK. So yeah. uh, there's supposed to be some change to the to the inductor uh, current. Inductor current, so right. therefore the reference current. Right. How does that get set into the control system? How, where does that OK, set so the question the is, so remember, the overall objective is to make sure our output voltage is constant, for instance, 10 volts, regardless of the changes in the input voltage or the load resistance. So the question is, if the load all of a sudden changes, for instance, from 10 ohms, it jumps to 5 ohms, how is it that we can actually provide extra current for the load? Okay? So um, if the load changes, let's say your load jumps up. Okay? Um, now, before the system actually recognizes anything has happened, this current is still constant. It hasn't really changed yet. So the output voltage increases. Something like this. When the output voltage increases, doing the, the feedback thing, 
you're subtracting, subtracting it for, from here, that means the reference decreases, okay? So, IREF decreases. And then because IREF decreases, IL follows that, and then the output voltage decreases. Something like this. I mean, this is an exaggeration, okay? So we have a little of a spike in the output voltage, but that spike causes our reference to go down, and then it remains down, because that's where it is supposed to be. All right, and we can actually, we have a simulation file. You can actually uh, remind me next time that I have the simulation file with me. I'll do a step change in the load resistance so you can actually see what, how it happens in the system. Uh, all right, other questions? Okay, so uh, let's kind of uh, play around with this model, uh, this equivalent signal model, and see if we can make it a little bit simpler. And honestly, I don't think we have enough time to do that. And I'm trying to here to follow the procedure that has been introduced in Ericsson and Maximovich's book. Uh, they have like a canonical model for all three classic converters. And what we are going to do next time on Thursday, I'm kind of play around, I'm going to play around with this model to make it closer to, this, to their canonical form. And then represent a general model that represents uh, equivalent circuit model for a single pole double throw switch that has current mode control applied to it. Okay, so probably that's what we're going to do on, on Thursday. Any questions? All right, so I'll see you guys on Thursday.